We're here to celebrate um, not only American writing, but the Juneteenth holiday, the day marking when news of the end of slavery reached the deepest parts of the former Confederacy in Galveston. Many of the writers and activists whose work led to the breaking of those chains are honored in our Dark Testament exhibit, and we continue to heed the relevant words on the struggle for freedom today. To begin tonight's conversation about representations of black history and black stories, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Adia Sykes. Adia Sykes is an arts organizer and curator in Chicago. Her practice seeks to center philosophies of improvisation, intuition, and care rooted in black feminist traditions. As an administrator advocating for racial equity and sustainable ecosystems for creative practitioners, she has held roles with organizations like the Chicago Artists Coalition, where she started their SPARK grant, a joint effort with the Joyce Foundation that provided unrestricted grants to artists of color, not formally trained artists, and artists with disabilities. At present, Adia is co-director of programs at Three Walls, a black woman-led arts organization that fosters contemporary art practices. She is also the lead organizer of the Chicago Art Census, a citywide research project that collects maps and visualizes data that illuminates the lived experiences and working conditions of art workers in Chicago. So I want to ask you all to help me welcome Adia Sykes. Hi there, everyone. Good evening. It's so odd to hear your bio read out loud, but I'm about to do the same thing <laughs> for Jaila Nila Anaila Avery, who, who wrote uh, Those Who Saw the Sun, African-American Oral Histories from the Jim Crow South. Jaha Nayila Avery is an African-American woman and proud Southerner. Hailing from Asheville, North Carolina, she received her law degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill where she studied constitutional and civil rights law. She spent several years in the startup tech space before embarking on her professional writing career. And her work can be found in the New York Times, Rolling Stone, and Architectural Digest. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and a Diamond Life member of the NAACP. Her aim is to always document, celebrate, and preserve the histories and stories of black people, communities, and their histories. Please join me in welcoming Jaha. Hello, hello, hello. This is so exciting for me. I'm excited to be here with you all and on Juneteenth, yes. Yeah, that deserves a hand clap. <laughs> I'm gonna share with you all a little bit about how the book came to pass. Um, and this is just a bit of the introduction of the book. And it starts with an African proverb. When an elder dies, a library burns. I was born in Asheville, North Carolina and raised primarily by my grandparents. This meant that my world was full of things loved by Southern African-American elders. For over two decades, I accompanied my grandparents to country buffets all over the South watching them pour packets of sugar into white ceramic cups of steaming coffee, the kinds of cups that those lovely little places are known for. We'd meet up with Deacon and Mrs. Splawn from church and share a meal at Shoney's, or we'd head to JNS cafeteria for Sunday dinner, where half of Black Asheville would stop by our table to extend their greetings to Reverend and Mrs. Avery and me. When Aunt Elsie and Uncle Kurt would come to town, Bojangles was the preferred fare, and always I was there, my grandparents' tiny companion. I knew better than to get into grown folks' business. So as they talked, I would busy myself with coloring, reading, or later, my cell phone, but I was always listening. I listened to my grandparents and their friends tell stories of their youth, stories of festivals and parties long since past, stories of what had happened at church on a given day decades prior, and various others. Some stories were steeped in humor, some tinged with disbelief, others told solemnly. There were many that I could relate to, like the stories my grandmother told about growing up on a farm and playing outdoors with her siblings. I didn't know what the words sharecropping or debt meant at the time, but I definitely understood hide and seek. My granddaddy loves telling the story of how nervous he had been to go to my grandmother's father and ask for her hand in marriage. I could just see the two of them, young and in love, 
graduates of Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, excited about living their lives together. Whenever he would talk about those days, my granddaddy would beam and laugh, and he'd have the whole room smiling along with him. Then there were the stories that I couldn't understand. There were stories about a world that long, no longer existed, a world that was hard for me to even imagine. It was ruled by somebody named Jim Crow. In these stories, my grandparents had to jump off the sidewalk when a white person walked by. In these stories, when my grandmother visited the Ambassador Theater in Raleigh as a college student, she had to sit in the balcony because black folks weren't allowed on the ground level. These stories saw my family placed under police protection in the 60s because of their work in the civil rights movement, while evil people placed bombs under their cars to stop them from protesting. I couldn't imagine anyone seeing my grandparents as something other than what I knew them to be kind, generous, exceedingly intelligent, brave, highly capable people. Racism at its core is nonsensical. And so as a young girl, I struggled to make sense of the sen senseless. Why had my grandparents been treated that way? My grandmother passed away in 2011 and it occurred to me then that if my family hadn't been listening to her stories and her life advice, it would have been gone forever. I realized then the importance of documenting the things that seem ordinary to us, because one day our ordinary will be history to someone else. Someone yet to be born will look back and wonder, what was it like? This is especially true for African Americans, because for centuries in this country, we were not able to document and preserve our own stories. Our ancestors were brought to America in chains torn from their native land, languages, and communities. Forbidden from learning to read or write, they did what they had to do to survive American slavery. I realize how privileged I am to be living in a time where I can read and write, seek higher education, and speak the truth about my own experiences. So I decided to use that privilege to do what so many generations of African Americans could not, tell the truth about history. Following my grandmother's death, I interviewed my granddaddy and several of my elderly family members. I interviewed people from church. I interviewed elders that I knew in the community. I interviewed for no other reason than to collect and preserve the wisdom of the elders. I do interviews here and there. It was something I did in my spare time and I enjoyed hearing people talk about their lives. I started out asking the same, of que the same questions of everyone and I'd modify the questions later in the interviews, depending on what they said. Years later, when I connected with Nick Thomas at Levine Carrito and started working on this book in earnest, I realized something very peculiar that I had only, that I had only understood, half understood earlier. A lot of African Americans didn't want to talk about the past. I had heard of similar sentiments before from elders whose grandparents or great grandparents simply refused to discuss what their lives were like during slavery. In my search for people to speak with for this book, many potential interviewees told me that they'd rather not bring history up. A 95-year-old elder in South Carolina said, it's best to not drum up the past, let it lay. An 87-year-old elder in Louisiana told me to leave those old days alone. I had many people agree to the interview at first, then call me back days later to withdraw. One person, an 81-year-old elder, elder in Georgia, actually stopped me mid-interview right after I'd asked the question, did you know anyone who was lynched? Apologetically, she told me that she wouldn't be going forward with her participation. Turns out this is all too much for this old girl, she remarked before hanging up. For many African-American elders, the past is just too painful to revisit. But here are too many, two major lessons that this process taught me as a writer and an oral history curator. One, don't interview anyone who isn't excited to participate and eager to share their story. Two, the right people will come. And when they do, their contributions will be more extraordinary than anyone could have ever imagined. I met Mr. Walter Carr at Inkwell Beach on Martha's Vineyard, and I just sensed that he had an incredible story to tell. 
Ms. Johnny Booker and I are both members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and we were introduced by our soror. Her confidence commanding pre her and commanding presence told me instantly that she would make a compelling interviewee. I met Ms. Florence Hayes while visiting Fisk University with my family. My brother is here actually, and whenever my family and I travel, we'll always visit HBCUs and support the campus bookstore, buy a bunch of uh, campus uh, nailia and the school apparel. And I stopped to ask her, for, ask her for directions to the bookstore, and her warmth was a signal to me that she would be a wonderful person to interview. While working on a project about African-American land ownership in the Black Belt of Alabama, I met Mrs. Leola Joe. When I spoke with her about my efforts for this book, she said, oh, you need to talk to my pastor. And that's how I met the bold, self-assured Reverend John Kennard. These are just a few examples of how all the right people came. We all know Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Angela Davis, and many others whose names have gone down in history. But there are people walking among us who were, who were leaders too, heroes too. It took an abundance of courage to survive Jim Crow and even more to actively participate in the civil rights movement and other efforts to secure rights and opportunities for African-American people. This book uplifts the lives and experiences of people that we haven't yet heard about. And there are countless more out there. Who are the people that you're walking alongside every day? They have stories too. And if not documented, these stories will be lost. I encourage you to start interviewing your family members, community members, teachers, mentors, and everyone in between. Preserve their experiences because there's nothing like hearing somebody's stories in their own words. Don't wait for others to tell it. The title of this book comes from the Bible verse Ecclesiastes 7:11, wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. The people who have entrusted all of us with these stories have given us something very valuable, their wisdom, knowledge, and life lessons. Most of the photos included with each interview came from each elder's personal collection, and a few are drawn from archival materials to illustrate some of the interview themes. The appendix at the back of the book offers more detail on various topics and can be used as a starting point for further research. Since 1619, people of African descent in this country have suffered some of the most horrifying abuses known to mankind. But the African-American story is ultimately one of beauty and joy, and the fact that we are still here, loving, living, thriving, is nothing short of miraculous. The memories held within these pages are a testament to that miracle. And I hope that you all are as empowered by these accounts as I have been. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading, my goodness. <laughs> And what food for thought as we get into a conversation with three of the artists included in the exhibition. Dorothy Burge is a fabric and multimedia artist and community activist who is inspired by history and current issues of social justice. Damon Lamar Reed. Damon Lamar Reed is a multi-hyphenate artist and public art maker who believes in the power of art and its ability to bring about positive change. And Dorian Sylvain, a studio painter, muralist, educator, and community planner whose collaborative art making practice, oh, you thought I was done. She got a bio bio. <laughs> whose collaborative art-making practice continues to inspire and build the next generation of culture keepers. We also have Bernard Williams in the audience, uh, the fourth artist in the exhibition, who I would be remiss to not also mention. And he is a multidisciplinary artist whose practice is an attempt to manage 
the overwhelming complexities of constructing histories. I'm gonna be fighting with this mic the whole time. So, much of y'all's work um, collecting oral histories, Dorothy, Damon, Dorian, in your artistic practices and the renderings of the literary giants that we saw in the exhibition. So much of that is rooted in storytelling, representing histories, preserving histories. And I don't think that any of us can emphasize enough the timeliness of these histories being told, not just because it's Juneteenth, but because of the direction that we see the pendulum of justice and democracy swinging in so many locales throughout this country. Bans on the books that many of the writers included. So I'm curious about y'all storytelling practices. For example, each of you has a voice of visual rhetoric expressed through color, through form, through material. And I'm interested in how you came to that. So how do you all, how did you all, and how do you all continually find your voice as creatives when engaging with this work for the exhibition and for this series in particular? Is on? Oh, okay. Still hey, on. hey, everybody. Hello. Um, so I, I find that question really um, to be very uh, loaded in a very positive way because so much of what my practice over the four decades that I've been uh, in Chicago working has been about telling stories, but oftentimes in, in, a, in a variety of manners. Um, my foundation was uh, actually in the black theater. And in the black theater is where I learned the most about collaboration and where I learned the most about uh, shared vision to tell one, one singular story and how all these disciplines work together to tell that story from various angles, be it costuming, lighting, sound, uh, production manager. And so a lot of those skills I, I brought with me as I evolved and started doing more public art, more uh, public murals. And it's, it's still the same process. It's us as artists being open to conversation with community. It is us as artists trying to interpret and elevate the things that are important for community. Um, and that is an ethic that I learned within the black theater environment where it was about listening. Uh, as an artist, much of our responsibility is about listening and then interpreting. Um, and so I have found that on many, many of the different um, facets of my career, it always comes back to that idea of collaboration, comes back to that idea of um, uh, distilling ideas down to simple truths that we can then interpret uh, within our artistic lens. Hi. Uh, I come from a long line of quilters. So my mother quilted, my grandmother quilted, my great-grandmother quilted. And I was lucky enough to know, have known my great-grandmother. She didn't pass away until I was 17 years old. And so I would go to Mississippi and they would say, come in and let me show you how to quilt. And I would say, no, cause that's for old people. <laughs> I don't wanna do that. So um, I started quilting because Trayvon Martin was killed. And I did not have a sign. So I made, I took one of my great nephew's photos that we had him in a hoodie with iced tea and Skittles. And I turned that into a quilt and I took it downtown to protest with. And the experience that I had of people stopping me and saying, we want to take a photo of you with the quilt or people asking me questions about why is that baby quilt have, why, why is the baby in the quilt holding Skittles and iced tea? What is that for? And so 
that's when I began to realize the power of telling the story from the perspective of an African-American woman and mother and how to tell the story from my perspective about how I feel about what's happening uh, on a number of different issues. And that's how I use the quilting. Hey, I would say uh, for me, you know, I also do like hip hop music. So when I do, you know, or when I kind of approach art, to me, it's kind of like a song, you know, like, you know, doing a, paint, a painting, you know, it's different elements. So any painting I do or, you know, mosaic or whatever, mural, I'm trying to tell a story, but I'm trying to, you know, like hip hop, okay, you got the beat, you know, that maybe, all right, we need some, you know, blue over here. You know, maybe we need these strokes going this way. You know, we need the bars. We got to, you know, make sure the eyes are, you know, popping. So I'm just kind of thinking of it, you know, in like a musical context. So, um, and you, and you know, like with these portraits, you know, I was just aiming to show, you know, to bring out the life, to bring out the color in, you know, in all the portraits I did. So that was my way of, you know, telling their story. All of you such masterful storytellers, even of your own practices. <laughs> it's such a privilege to sit here and listen to more about your work. Um, Jaha, similar question for you. Um, I'm interested in not just the fact that you're collecting stories, but particularly oral histories. It's a particular mode of allowing individuals to articulate their own experiences, their own histories. Why that modality of storytelling for you in this work? I believe that oral history is the truest form of history because we're hearing history from the people that lived it firsthand. We're hearing it from their own mouths. We're not hearing it from the history book from somebody else who had no idea about these communities and these people that are telling it through their own lens and their own perspective. And so, um, you know, in the African American in the African American tradition and West African tradition period, and a lot of other cultures, oral history is so important. And that is the way that stories are passed down. I remember the first time I went to Ghana, I went to, I was in some small villages and you can, go into the village and there's an elder there and they will tell you the history of that village and every family in that village from for centuries back they can go for centuries back and so um that oral history tradition is so strong and it's something that our ancestors retained even through the belly of the slave ships even through american slavery and everything that has happened since then and uh it's such a blessing to be able to have those stories and to preserve that history. Um, me personally, um, and as I said, my brother is here, our family has been in North Carolina for 300 years. We've been enslaved in that state for longer than we've been free in that state. And our family was one of the families that built that state. And so that history was passed down to us and we were able to preserve that. And so we know who we are. And I think that everyone deserves that gift of knowing who they are and knowing where they came from. And for so many of us, that has been stripped away, but we can retain that. We can, we can reclaim the, that information and reclaim that power. And we should never forget that that is the root of who we are as a people, as families, as communities, et cetera, and hold on to that with everything. Mm. Can, can I add on to that? Please. Because I find an interesting relationship between what you're saying and what uh, Dame and Bernard and I do as public artists. And it is about using public space sometimes to talk about shared histories, to talk about shared dreams and visions. And as public artists, what we run into oftentimes in our own communities is that there's still a void of information. There's still a void um, of uh, access to uh, black history and black celebration. And so as public artists, it's, it's such a joy to be able to 
bring that kind of energy to a public space that we can all enjoy and share and we can continue to call out the names of our heroes and our sheroes and, and mm -hmm. not forget. Yes. I also wanted to add that another thing that happens with the quilts is it allows us to tell the story from our perspective. And so there's a series of quilts that I'm working on right now and it is about the people who were tortured by John Burge, the police commander John Burge, from 1972 to 1991. Nobody's talking about this issue anymore, and there are 26 people who are still incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So there's a series of quilts that I'm working on right now that tells the story, and we've also interviewed them so that when you go and see the quilt, you will also hear the story of what happened to them from their perspective. Yeah, no, I, I just, you know, I agree that, you know, art, I mean, I believe if you're doing art and you're not telling some type of story, then, you know, kind of, what are you doing? But, um, <laughs> you know, in my own work, like I, I have a series called Still Search and I do portraits of uh, missing black women and I kind of consider myself like a voice for the voiceless because, you know, they don't really get media attention. So it's kind of, you know, telling that story that's, you know, that we don't hear about. Mm, thank you all. There's such a beautiful through line between the oral histories that are collected, individuals in their purest form and most honest way telling their stories. And then Doreen used the word distillation. Say distillation, then rearticulation, maybe of these histories and these celebrations of different stories within your communities through public art. And we don't have a ton of time before question before Q&A. But I do want to talk a little bit about joy, black joy in particular, which might sound like a little bit of a pivot, but I promise it's not. Uh, because while there's such gravity to the subject matter that the writers in the exhibition discuss, or grapple with to the reading that we just heard and the practice of uh, collecting stories and histories that might not want to be told or celebrated. But I can't help but to also want to bring in the richness, the expansiveness, and the celebration that's so much a part of the Black experience and our existence, really, because I firmly believe that our ancestors were able to envision a better future for all of us, and that is part of their survival tactic. So one of my own grounding lights, who's included in the exhibition, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, said in her high school yearbook that she has a heart with a room for every joy. And she certainly lived that way, if you know anything about Zora Neale Hurston. And so I want to ask you all, where do you situate joy levity, humor, within your work and your practice and your storytelling, where do those come into play? Well, I talked about this a little bit in the book and, and what I just read, and I truly believe that the African-American story is one of joy underlying overall yes, that it is rooted in joy. And so uh, for the people that I interviewed, it's very interesting because uh, they did grow up during the era of Jim Crow, but when I talked to them about their childhood experiences and their lives and their homes and their families and everything like that, they didn't talk about Jim Crow. They didn't talk about, oh, well, you know, we couldn't drink this water fountain or whatever it was. They, their first thoughts and the first things that they communicated to me were that we had school dances. You know, we went to Sunday school, we dressed up, we had pageants and we had, you know, we, the, the, we had all of these different things that were going on. And so it was such a strong sense of community, a strong sense of um, lovingness and a strong sense of support within that community. And so I think that, I mean, it's, it's really all rooted in, in the community. It's really all rooted in the fellowship and everything like that. The, you know, Jim Crow and the, the things imposed on the black community during Jim Crow, that was something that was forced upon the community. It wasn't something that the community mm -hmm. 
felt that, okay, you know, this defines us and this is, you know, who we are. They knew who they were and they talk about it in their accounts in the book. And so I found that so interesting because for me as a millennial, I can't imagine having to sit in the back of the bus or sit in the balcony or, you know, do some of the things that my grandparents had to do. They had to do those things so that I could be able to go to school and go to law school and be sitting here with you all mm -hmm. and having written a book and talking to you all about it. And so I just, joy is at the root of everything I do. It's at the root of all of my storytelling and at the root of all of my work. Mm -hmm because to me, that is the story. That is where, that is the, the identity of the community. And so I try to always keep that at the forefront. Mm. I, I agree completely. It's uh, everything that I do as an artist, as a community member, as a, as a mother, a daughter, an aunt, it's all about joy. It's all about sharing. It's all about uh, finding those, those sweet spots that, that we can connect through. And one of, in my uh, particular practice as a public artist, one of the places that I really find joy is when I can bring public together and use art making as a medium of conversation. And uh, one of the reasons why that brings me uh, so, uh, particularly so much joy is because I know for many people they have not been given access to the idea of being a creative. And somewhere early in our lives we have been kind of encouraged to either claim it or let it go. And somewhere around, my experience as a teacher is that somewhere around fourth grade, fifth grade, kids either decide they're an artist or they're not. Yeah. And so whenever I can provide public opportunities for people to come in and, and paint and, and be creative and, and share and talk about their ideas, um, it feels like people are being liberated. You know, it feels as though there has been a lot of um, uh, repression uh, within their lives that somebody somewhere has told them that they're not a musician or they're not a painter or they're not an artist. And um, so it's special to, to give people that opportunity to express themselves. Mm -hmm. The thing that gives me joy is that I quilt about a lot of social justice issues. I'm an activist. I call myself a quiltivist because I use my quilting to do the activism. And so what gives me joy is that people will often come to see quilts who are quilters. And when they get there, they'll say, what is this about? Who are these people? What's the story behind this quilt? And then once they learn the story, how do you then move them to action? To do something about the wrongs that have been committed in this country. And what really gives me joy is that I have been working on a series of quilts about different issues that have impacted the African American community in a negative way. And I meet the people who I have done the quilts about. Mm -hmm. I have met mm -hmm. Trayvon's mother and father, mm -hmm. and they have signed the quilt that I did. Uh, that honored him. I have met the bird survivors when they are returning from, from prison uh, after being tortured into confessions. And we have ongoing relationships. We're really close. And that's really, really important to me. And that really gives me a lot of joy. So I get to meet a lot of people who I do the quilts about and having those relationships with them is what gives me the joy. Yeah, I like to say, well, on a, you know, just on a, a basic, you know, point that me actually being able to do what I love, make money f for it, and be able to impact people's lives, you know, to me, that's the ultimate joy. But then on the flip side of that, you know, you can have a career, but then you can also have, you know, well, I think if you have a career, you should also have your purpose. You know, a career is how you make money. Your purpose is how you um, affect other people. So I believe that I, my art is the purpose that, or one of the reasons that I'm here. So, you know, somebody met, you know, you're a writer, you know, somebody else is, you know, I don't know, you may be a financial analyst or something, but everybody has something that they can, 
that they are here to share with somebody else. And for you to share it and for other people to receive it, that's like, you know, a joy that's kind of, you know, going back and forth, you know, because, you know, it's kind of like you see somebody, you know, yesterday I bought a woman a sandwich and like she was, you know, she was really happy because, you know, she was hungry. But it also gave me joy just to, you know, to see how, you know, that impacted her. So, you know, I, you know, that's just a big thing for me. And then when I'm actually, you know, working on art, you know, a lot of the, every painting I do, I, I lead with like love, you know, it comes from a perspective of love. So, you know, I'm thinking about the colors, um, you know, like I said, even if I'm doing a painting of a missing woman, I don't, I want you to think of the beauty of the art first. And then, you know, then you find out what it's about and that can impact you a certain way. So, yeah. Mm, do we have time for one more? Great. A little time check. Um, before we wrap up, uh, all of you all expressed not just you were, uh, thoughts and really how you enact and move with joy through the work and have it represented in the work. But there was also such attention to humanity, particularly for black folks, recognizing the fullness of that humanity, how um, no black person, the black experience is not a monolith. There was such complexity revealed in all that you just said. And so, I want to take us to the works that are on display. And if y'all haven't gone out to check out all of these portraits, they are uh, in the gallery behind you. But there are these symbols embedded in them. And each of these symbols is a celebration of that individual and their story. So I, so I wonder, uh, through your learning and sometimes relearning about some of these literary giants, how did those symbols move to the fore of your mind as you're distilling so much history and information? What did you choose to celebrate and honor in those portraits? What I wanted to do with the symbols that I put on the quilts in this exhibit is to make the connection between history. And so each quilt has an Adinkra symbol, which is from West Africa. And each Adinkra symbol stands for a certain thing. And so when you go to the quilt and you scan the Adinkra symbol, you will see what the meaning is and you will see how it relates to the person who the quilt is uh, of. Um, similarly, I use a lot of symbolism, pattern, um, very specific color palettes uh, in my practice and with the portraits that we did here, one of the things that um, I wanted to explore was also the idea of kind of pushing color a little bit and using color in a, a more non-traditional manner. So uh, the symbols, um, particularly Maya Angelou, who is one of my all-time favorites, and she, uh, as a matter of fact, um, as my boys were growing up, that we used to listen to her reciting her poetry on her tapes back in the day <laughs> when they were on tapes. Um, <laughs> But it, her symbol was around uh, one of her real groundbreaking books, you know, um, I Know Why Cage Birds Sing. And so I was leaning on those symbols because I think that that book for her was so pivotal in terms of uh, her own personal growth and her own personal journey. And oftentimes when I use symbols, even in my work, um, particularly Adinkra symbols, I use a lot. It's that, that idea of how do you distill a big idea like, like independence or a big idea like you know um, freedom. Uh, how do you distill that into something that 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 you visually can kind of take in in a matter of seconds? And uh, and in those matters of seconds, we're we're communicating, you know, the artist to to the audience. And so that's how I kind of approach those symbols um, with these four uh, giants that that I uh, portrayed in the portraits. Yeah, I kind of took like a, I guess like a simplistic approach. You know, I kind of thought about it that if somebody is, you know, seeing a portrait and they they have no idea who it is or they've never seen them before, 
like, okay, can they look at this symbol and what can they kind of figure out, you know, from that? So, you know, that's what I did. Thank you all so much. I believe we're going to start audience Q&A, but could we please give a massive round of applause to these four creators? There should be a mic going around, no? Perfect. I didn't receive this part of the email. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll ask you to stand. Um, if you want to stand up. I would just say, if I could raise my sister, her foot is going to the Smithsonian in Rock. Oh my God. You ain't God. say that, for That's amazing. Oh, sure. Yes. They turn up in the most unexpected places. And I saw your beautiful quilt at the cultural center the other day and was just blown away and was so proud to tell people a little bit about you and your work. I'm curious as, um, what did you learn? What was your biggest challenge and what did you learn um, uh, during uh, the Dark Testament? Uh, For those who might not have heard in the back, our question up front was, what did you all learn during the process of Dark Testament of, and your biggest challenge? Well, I learned that the struggle still continues. It just, it just makes you crazy when, when you look at history and you, know, you feel like these are moments in history where it feels like we're making leaps forward and then you find out that, nope, we were actually taking a few steps backwards. <laughs> and so when I um, was doing more research, you know, about the authors that I was focused on, it just felt like you could be saying this right now. These issues are things that are still, still on our to-do list. Mm -hmm. And so I found that kind of frustrating. <laughs> I think one of the things that I learned is when I started to put the symbols into the quilts. And so I was looking for different symbols that really told the story of the quilt. So for uh, Zora Neale Hurston, her symbol is Jinyame, which, is mean, which means God is all powerful because of the, the story that she wrote about their eyes were watching God. Uh, for um, Ida B. Wells, it's how do you have endurance when you're fighting a battle? Yeah. Yeah. And so each symbol, I was trying to find a symbol that spoke to who this particular author was. Yeah, I learned that there's still a lot of history that needs to be told. Like, you know, for some of the portraits I did, I didn't know who they were before I painted them. And likewise, even when I, you know, like I made my post on social media, like on, I posted a TikTok and I was like, you know, did my portrait reveal, like, who is this? You know, and a lot of people, other people didn't know who the people were. So just that, you know, we still have a lot more history to, you know, to circulate, to get out there. I'll repeat it. Okay. So mentioned the symbols and Zora's symbol. I'm wondering in what ways does spirituality intersect in your arts mm. and Ooh. storytelling? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Inspired by Dorothy's answer, uh, the question is, what role does spirituality play or where does it intersect within the work? I can just say that there are times when I am sitting at home quietly and something will hit me and it'll say you need to do something about this particular issue whether it be uh, the different artists it was like what colors do you use um, what really gives their story so I am really uh, inspired by whatever moves me 
will go into that particular piece of art. I live across the street from the house where Ida B. Wells lived. So I was inspired because I walked by, stood in front of her house, and just was like, okay, it's gonna come to you what exactly you should do. And so I think that for a lot of the art that I do, something moves me and it makes me feel like you need to do something about this particular issue. I guess for me, it is the idea that um, my skill sets are available to kind of uplift community, to help tell broader stories. And so for me, it's, it's that just walking in the light, you know, just knowing that it's gonna be okay. It's, it's, it's even claiming at some point in my life that I'm an artist and this is what I'm gonna do, you know. Um, all of that comes with, with that, uh, that idea of faith in your creative vision. And I tell young artists all the time, don't forget that you get to design your life. You get to create it the way you want, you know? And so to me, that has been um, a, uh, a big representation of how spirituality has um, been present in my practice. Yeah, I think I kind of hit on that a little earlier when I just said like every, you know, project I do, it kind of starts with, you know, love and, you know, that's, you know, the love of God. So, yeah, talk about that. I would say that mm -hmm. I've had that same experience, though, where I'm just sitting there and all of a sudden something hits. And to me, that's God. That's the ancestors. That's somebody telling me, listen, you need to do this. It, your voice needs to be the one that's out there. You have the opportunity. You have to take the opportunity. This is, you know, we, we're calling you to do this. And so I take that very seriously and that's that's how it kind of presents itself for me. I was just about to ask you because I was like, we got to get your voice up I in had here. To think. I had to think, <laughs> sis. <laughs> that was a deep question. <laughs> I was like, dun dun, you got me. <laughs> yes. Were all, all of you self-taught? I, I don't remember from the bios. Because you're an attorney. <laughs> So our, our question at the front was, our question at the front was uh, about your education and experience in art making. Does well, I don't have practice MFAs, the law. I'll say that. I wouldn't call myself an attorney because <laughs> I don't practice. Um, but I did go to law school. I, I studied constitutional and civil rights law. I've always been interested. I've always been on the front lines from the black community. Let me just say that. So when I was in law school, I wanted to know about how these issues presented themselves, particularly when it came to the North Carolina Constitution, me being a Carolina girl through and through, I needed to know what happened, how is the law interpreted in this state, and how can I actually take that knowledge and bring that to my community in a beneficial way. That's why I went to law school. But then I felt like I could do more when it came to um, my voice as a writer versus toiling away in the law for 50 years. And then in North Carolina, at least, and all over the country, really, we're seeing a lot of things being rolled back. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started to see that, okay, um, I really want to take that information that I've learned and I want to take this knowledge that I learned from law school, but I want to take that to the next level, incorporating the community as well and giving the community a voice too. And so that's kind of how I veered into, uh, into writing versus uh, being a, a practicing attorney. And I was bored when I was practicing the law. <laughs> but this is much more fun. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have always known, I'm one of those kids who was like, I always knew I was going to be an artist. And um, I did uh, get my um, undergrad from San Francisco State, but I am a uh, life learner. I'm always pursuing uh, workshops and residencies and uh, extended education programs. And as old as I am, I still think about doing my master's sometimes, but you should do it. <laughs> I stay busy though with work, so I haven't you been able to carve busy. that time out yet. <laughs> oh, sorry. It, 
it's very interesting to me to talk about my education because I have a degree in industrial design. So I went to UIC and thank you. <laughs> I just found out recently that I'm the first woman and the first African American to get a degree in industrial design from UIC. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I never used the degree. <laughs> as soon as I graduated, I decided that I needed to be an urban planner. And so I went into urban planning and I did community development planning uh, from a uh, community perspective for years. I worked at the United Way uh, giving uh, different uh, uh, grants to different community-based organizations who were not getting grants. And so what I would do is I would go into different neighborhoods and I would show people how to write the grants and how to explain what it was that they were gonna use the money for. And then that would help them get the money from the United Way to do what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I really just uh, started quilting because of the social justice issues that were impacting me. However, I can say this, I am a member of an organization called the Women of Color Quilters Network. We quilt uh, about social justice issues with women of color from around the world. Mm -hmm. And when I met the head of the Women of Color Quilters Network, I had done my quilt about Trayvon Martin, and I went to her and I said, so do you ever take quilts from people who aren't people, who aren't members of the Women of Color Quilters Network? And she said, show me what you have. So being that I am not tech savvy, I had a picture on my phone, but I couldn't pull it up. So I went home after she gave me her card and put all quilts that I had ever done in a box and sent them to her. <laughs> and she called me up and she critiqued each quilt. And this is what she said to me. She said, you have really good ideas, strong ideas and strong perspective. However, your quilting sucks. <laughs> so, you need to learn how to quilt if you want to be a quilter. Oh. So then I had to go back and learn how to quilt. School of life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a BFA from the School of the Art, Inst Art Institute of Chicago. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how much I learned from there, but. But I got, but when I tell people I go there, they think I'm good. So. <laughs> you just got a name drop it, and people. <laughs> Any additional questions? Yeah, I would certainly say that you guys are um, interpreters for our community. Um, but wanted to ask you as, but I also see you as like cultural interpreters as well. And how do you? that or how do you want your work to be interpreted by those individuals who are not as fluent in our culture as we are? Mm. That's a mouthful. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, well, I know uh, for me, you know, just creating, uh, you know, community art, it is, you know, like the perspective is kind of like a everybody perspective. So when I do create that, I kind of have in mind, you know, I look at public art is like fine art in a public space, you know, and I feel like it's not really respected like it should be because some people say, okay, they do like, those are some murals over there. And then like, you know, I like to say, I bring the neighborhood to the gallery and the gallery to the neighborhood. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, you know, I don't know if you're, a, you know, a 40 year old white man, you should be able to look at my mural and say, wow, that's a masterpiece. But if you're, you know, a 12 year old black boy, you should have like the same, you know, thing because good to me, good art is good art. So. Um, I, well, I think for me, 
Um, I'm, I'm sure my publisher won't be, ha they're not here, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> I don't necessarily think about the audience. I think for me at the forefront is telling the truth about history, giving voice to people that have not historically been able to tell their stories in a truthful, uh, loud, authentic manner. And that is what I care about. So I don't think about the audience. I have, my publisher thinks about the audience a lot. <laughs> but me, I think I, I really try to keep that at the forefront because I think if I start thinking about, well, who is this for and who's going to be reading this and this and that, then that's when all of these different voices start coming into play. And then I feel like I, it, it's easy to lose track of of, of what my, my goal is, which is to really uplift African-American history, black history period across the board, but specifically African-American because I'm African-American. So I want that history to be out there. I want it to be told and I want it to be preserved in a truthful manner. And that is always what's at the forefront when it comes to my work. Everything else is kind of secondary. So my perspective on that, is um, because I do indulge in a lot of conversation with community. Um, I indulge in a lot of uh, art making practices with community. But at the end of the day, I feel that what we community, me as an artist, what we have kind of come up with collectively, it's kind of like decorating your home. It doesn't matter if you like it when when you come to visit me it's my home right your home it's your home <laughs> <laughs> and so to, to me public art is about creating a public space that feels like home that feels mm -hmm. like us you know feels like me we <laughs> so in addition to doing a lot of the uh social justice quilts that i do I also do workshops where I ask people from the neighborhood to come in and we will come up with a theme that we want to create a series of quilts around. So I have worked with young people and uh, I was at the Smart Museum last summer and I was working with these young people and I said, we did a restorative justice circle. So I showed them the technique and I said, okay, now, I can't tell you what's important to you. You need to tell me what the subject matter of your quilts will be. And then mm -hmm. I left. And when I mm -hmm. came back, we, had, we were on the same page. They said gun violence. Mm -hmm. And so they did a series of quilt patches where they sent messages about gun violence. Recently, I was meeting with a, a group of veterans who were from the Afghanistan war and they also created a series of patches about things that they wanted the public to know about what it was like to be a soldier of color in the Afghanistan war. And so I think that to me, it's being able to show different techniques that you can use to send a message. And I think that's really powerful I think we have one more and then we'll wrap it up. All the questions have come from the front. <laughs> I'm just saying, anybody in the back? <laughs> yes. Thank you all for sharing your story. Very inspirational and I'm just inspired by what you've done. My question is how do we get more youth engaged and involved and get more youth to be interested in your work, interested in the artists that you're celebrating? Looking around here, I don't see a whole lot of young people. So I'm just worried about how boring that the message is not well I was kind of quick to grab the mic because core to my practice is working with young artists and working with uh, particularly youth within community in general and there's one thing in my four decades of experience that, that I know to be true and that is a lot of our young people of color are living in communities that are virtual arts education deserts. And they're starving for it. They need it. It, is, it has been a true crime that uh, our public schools have been allowed to remove all of these very important disciplines from um, the educational experience. 
So for me, it's about trying to offer those opportunities. I mentor a lot of young people, particularly in that 20-something zone. We have a lot of young people who didn't want to make the leap to art school or didn't have the resources or whatever. But I try to serve in my small capacity as a bridge, uh, not only for training for these young artists, but a bridge directly into some opportunities, uh, giving them um, business savvy and giving them um, practical experience. Uh, so it is a growing problem, but one that I, I personally um, um, try to confront every day in my practice. So I come from a really big family, and so there are lots of youth in my family. And so uh, art is not being taught in schools anymore. And so one of the things that I propose to my sisters and brothers is that I am going to do a series of art workshops for the young people in my family this summer, and that I will teach them how to use scissors, I will teach them how to paint, I will teach them how to draw. I also have a residency at Little Black Pearl, which is an art center. And being at Little Black Pearl, I get to interact with a lot of high school students. And they come down uh, and we talk about different art forms. So they may not be into quilting. However, when they are into social justice, then they might be willing to make a quilt or they might be willing to do some other kind of art form to send a message. And so I have become the grandmother of Little Black Pearl, which is a wonderful thing for me. Yeah, I think I definitely think it's about making it accessible, um, making the information accessible. Um, one thing that I do, I teach um, a summer writing class workshop at uh, the Christine W. Avery Learning Center back home. And uh, there's a different theme every summer. Last summer we worked on Afrofuturism. They were learning about Fannie Lou Hamer and they were learning about um, various, uh, the Freedom Riders and various people who really made it possible for black people to be able to vote. And so one of the things, the activities that I gave them was listen, if Fannie Lou Hamer were to meet T'Challa from Black Panther, what would that conversation be? And you know, for them, that was so accessible. They loved T'Challa. They were learning about Fannie Lou Hamer and a lot of them, and I gave them, you know, liberty to, okay, what do you, you know, you can use whatever medium you want. So some of them ended up drawing comic strips. Some of them actually uh, wrote poems. Some of them wrote short stories. And it was so interesting seeing what they came up with. And I think just making it accessible to youth, you know, they get excited about that and they want to, you know, if you talk to them about something that they care about and they love and then they're learning it, um, it was it was just so exciting to see. So this summer we're working, we're going to, the topic is uh, freedom dreaming. So I'm trying to come up with some interesting prompts because I feel like Afrofuturism is going to be hard to, to beat because last year they were so excited about that. Um, but I think just making it accessible. And then again, um, I always go back to the oral history piece as well. Um, we know the proverb, each one teach one. So when I'm around young people, I try to teach them about, or, or you know, talk to them about various things when it comes to our history. Um, I think that's so important. And again, like even, even interviewing older family members, even, you know, talking to just, just people that have that wisdom, I think it really helps a lot and it helps to make that something that's special for them even if they may not see it at the time because when my grandparents were telling me stuff I was just like all right whatever but now today I'm like that was really valuable and I really appreciate that time and that information that they gave to me and so I think just planting that seed makes all the difference yeah I think it's uh, exposure you know a lot of you know, if you're not open to it, I, be, I became a mural artist because my last semester in college, I, the uh, artist who's not here right now, Bernard Williams, he came to my class and he showed his murals. And, he, you know, and a lot of people don't know you can make a, a, like, I didn't know you could make a career in mural painting or, you know, a lot of people, you know, starving artists and like all this stuff. So 
you know, kid, you know, kids think you can make money being a rapper. So, you know, if it's something about rap, hey, yeah, I can do it. But they don't know that, hey, you can, you know, you can be a writer, you can be an artist and things like that. Cause I know when Bernard came to my class, I'm like, well, you know, how much you get paid for that? You know? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? Okay, you know, let me show you my portfolio here, you know. <laughs> But I was I was his assistant like a month or two later, and you know here I am now. So yeah. Well, thank you all so so much, and thank you all for your questions as well.